Okay, you're rolling. Okay. Next up, we have reverse engineering malware for newbies with Joe Giron and with the assistance of Eric Davidson. Please give him a warm welcome. Okie dokie, show of hands. Who here actually knows a little tiny bit of assembly? Great, this, this means it's gonna go a hell of a lot smoother. All right, so this is what we're gonna cover right now. We're gonna go over the basics of assembly again. Tools of the trade, setting up an environment, basic malware analysis, probably what everyone wants to see. Um, an intro to the debugger. Um, reporting, oh my god, I'm stuck, um, unpacking 101, dynamic analysis, memory analysis, where do I get it, and additional resources. All right, so here we have the first part. Technical difficulties. And today I have with me Mr. Eric Davidson from this morning who will now speak on my behalf on the very basics of x86 and 64-bit assembly. Stand up. Should I plug it in? Plug it in, bro. How many people are already at it this morning? Some of you, all of you, none of you? I'm just going to, yeah, how about the people who hasn't? Who has, who didn't see the, the talk this morning? on basic x86 assembly. So I'm going to talk to, to you and you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, it's, yeah. Cool, I guess we'll stand. Um, so the people that were already here, this is literally the same, some of the same stuff, but not, not the whole thing, just like uh, the basics, like registers, stack, um, and some instructions. So. Um, if you're used to high-level languages, registers are just like variables. Um, if it's 32-bit, you get um, four bytes. If it's 64-bit, you get eight bytes. Um, that's about all there is to registers for general purpose. Um, here's your instruction queue, um, which you'll be seeing a lot in immunity in, in the case of uh, his presentation. Um, but it's still the same thing. You got your addresses, you got your machine code, and you got your actual instructions. Um, the stack, I think, is the big one. Not that stack. That stack. Um, so let me refresh it real quick. That was not refresh. That's refresh. OK, so um, stack is, is just memory. Um, that's all it is, just a different area of memory. Um, but instead of uh, addressing that memory by an address, um, like uh, say like specifically this area of memory I want to move from or to or whatever. You don't do that with the stack. You, you push data to the stack and you pop data from the stack and from only one location, which is the top of the stack, like the top of the stack, um, like a stack of plates. You can push plates on, ta on top, but um, you can't just take a plate from the middle. You could, but you shouldn't. Um, <laughs> yeah, stack frames and all that, you can abuse that. But uh, like I said earlier, um, just the simple pushing to the top and popping from the top. So uh, in this scenario, I want to reverse the um, values in each of those registers or variables, um, EAX, EBX, and ECX. Um, so I can push them all to the top of the stack, and then I can pop them all off in a different, uh, well, in the same order, but it would be different because of how the stack uh, is ordered. So, so we pushed EAX to the top of the stack, pushed EBX to the top of the stack, pushing everything else down, pushed ECX to the top of the stack, and then we can pop everything in that same order, but it'll actually reverse it because of what's now on the top of the stack. So if we pop EAX, the Fs will go to it. And like that, that's the stack. Uh, is there anything else in that that you wanted me to? No, that was it. I thought you talked so well on it, I thought I'd steal it. Yeah. Or shoehorn it in somehow. So now let's. Stay up here, man. I don't like that. That's not cool, man. That's not cool, bro.
Alrighty, tools of the trade. These are the tools every single reverse engineer in this room or potential reverse engineer in this room should probably have. Number one is your best friend. It's the debugger. Um, there's a lot of people on, on Windows. The two big ones are still um, IDA and all EDBG, but I really like Immunity Debugger. Um, uh, if you heard me earlier in, the, in his talk, I was talking about why I like Immunity so much. Immunity supports a Python scripting language. Like, a, it has a Python shell within, and it has its own library, and you can manipulate it and make it do stuff, and it's pretty nice. Number two, you're going to need a disassembler. Disassembler, once again, IDA, OLLI, Immunity Debugger, Win Debugger. I really don't like Win Debugger, I just threw it up there. Winbag. Winbag. System monitoring tools. For general reason, for general purpose stuff, if, 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 if you ever encounter a piece of malware and, and you can't crack it, like it's packed somehow and you have no idea what it's packed with, you can still get a wealth of information from the malware with system monitoring utilities like API Monitor or ProcMon, Process Hacker, amazing one, uh, Process Explorer from Windows, great tools. And then there is all the other miscellaneous tools. There seems like there's seems like there's hundreds of them, but these are the main ones I use. EXE info, it's a really handy utility. It'll actually identify uh, packers. Um, PEID used to do that about seven years ago. Then they stopped updating, and now it just sucks. So they they, they took the torch and carried it on. So EXE info number one, hands down, best tool. Hook Analyzer, another great dynamic analysis tool. The Cuckoo Sandbox Suite, amazing if you can set it up. If, if, if you don't, if you can't, then just forget it. Um, GMER, an, an amazing tool. It's a, it's, a, it's a root kit detector, great tool. Um, root Repeal, another amazing tool, but it only works on 32-bit. They never made a 64-bit version, so that's why it goes below GMR or GMER. Wireshark, well, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, Votality, oh, did I say, was it Volatility, Votality? Volatility. Tomato, tomato. So, vo Volatility, a great memory forensics tool. Sh you should have it just handy. Um, side note, a side note for Votality, you should also have the uh, memory dumping capabilities that go with, uh, a memory dumper of some kind to go with it, because Unlike all the other, unlike Hook Analyzer or, or some of these other tools, um, Votal or Volatility works static, meaning it, you can't just run it. You have to like save something and then work through it. So that's why it goes at the bottom of the list. HXD is an amazing hex editor, and it's free. All these tools, by the way, they're, they're free, uh, except for IDA. I, I guess that's free, but all right. JD GUI, Java Disassembler, P32 DASM, Visual Basic, Classic, since a lot of, a lot of malware you'll run into is actually run, written in Classic Visual Basic. I don't know why, I think it's just to confuse and anger me. <laughs> uh, let's, also Delphi, and uh, no, enough about Delphi. CFF Explorer, another amazing tool. Win Prefetch Viewer, the prefetch is on Windows. Anytime you execute something, a uh, prefetch entry is created. This tool will actually tell you a list of anything that was run recently. So, it's pretty handy, right? Auto runs, another pretty useful tool because I really can't remember all, all the different places up that could place something in startup. Most malware will stick to the, you know, the classic two or three places, but it helps if you can't remember all that, like me, to just, just to use auto runs. Like I said, all of them, they all, there's a lot of tools and a lot of stuff to go over, but they all serve a purpose. All right, setting up your environment. Every environment should be taken off your network unless absolutely necessary. Use a VM. Sandboxy is no substitute. Cuckoo works wonders if you can get it to work. And dual monitors are a godsend. If you do not have dual monitors, it's 2014. <laughs> have dual monitors. All right, now we're gonna talk about the debugger. The debugger is your best friend. Treat him with respect. There are mainly two different kinds of debuggers out there. There is the kernel debugger and the user mode debugger. For the most part, you'll never really step into a kernel mode debugger because there's no need to. 
unless, of course, you come across a case like Ben Fisher, but that's another talk and another time. Another topic, another title. I'll, I'll get into that later. Um, kernel debugger means it operates in ring zero in kernel mode at the driver level. Um, it also means it makes your system super duper unstable. And I can't tell you how many times I've crashed my operating system just by just messing around, pausing the operating system just to like look at a process and all of a sudden, poof, gone. User, so a user mode debugger is the opposite. Like I said, it operates in tandem in user mode space. Most of the time we're just gonna be, or most of your analysis will be done in a user mode debugger. So in, in, the, in the purpose of this talk, we'll be using immunity debugger because I like it. All right, so this is an immunity debugger breakdown. There's a lot of stuff here, so I'm gonna, Step up here and try and show you all the different things. Is that good? All right. So this is your main immunity debugger window. You'll see that it strikes us. It has a striking resemblance to Evans debugger, but I think this came before. But then again, Ollie beat a ball. So these we have our instruction window. We have our registers window, our dump window for memory, and this contents of the stack. Ah, uh, what, what is that? Yeah, can you, can you please move that? Oh, you broke, you broke it. The gods are not being pleasant. There's no touchpad. I have a mouse. Why didn't you use the mouse? Okay. All right. Thank you for breaking it and whatever. All right. So these other things you'll see all at the top, all these different options, L, E, M, T, W, T, W, H, C, P, K, B, Z, R, dot, 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 S, all, they all mention, they all represent something else. So, L stands for log, anytime something happens in the log, like a program screws up or there's some problem with the analysis, it'll show up there. E stands for executable, wait, I'm getting ahead of myself, one sec. There we go. Show the log, show loaded modules, show the memory map, show threads, show window handles, Show, um, show handle or show Windows info. Wi by Windows info, I mean if a program has a bunch of different windows, it'll tell you like the the window class they belong to. If you've ever done any Windows programming, it's really it's really handy stuff. Show handles any any time a program is any time a program accesses accesses something like uh, a registry entry or a file or something like that, it's going to have a handle, and this will tell you. So it's super duper handy. CPU show the CPU info. Show the call stack, show, show the uh, software breakpoints, show the hardware breakpoints, show the references, the dot, 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 and the dash, the dot, dot, dot is the, uh, I think that's run trace, but I, I really never use run trace. And the S stands for source. Also, I never use source. So technically, if you have your assembly source handy, like written in MASM or NASM or whatever, you can actually load it, and it'll actually tell you the individual lines by referring to dash S. By, ref by referring to the S, it'll tell you and help you debug assembly. But once again, I, I don't use that. Software breakpoints. Everyone should know about this kind of stuff, so I, I prefer to go over it. Like I said, this, the debugger is your friend, so you really should get in, get in contact with the debugger, you know, get, get to know them. So, a software breakpoint. Software breakpoints, like it says, CPU interrupts that can be placed anywhere in a program. When you have a software break, when you have a software breakpoint, the debugger simply writes the int3 instruction, or the opcode 0xcc over the first byte, and then it transfers execution over to it. When the debugger, blah, 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 blah. Hardware breakpoints. Hardware breakpoints are like software breakpoints, but you only get four of them. 
They, they reside in the registers DR0 through DR3. You actually do technically have several of them, DR0 through DR7, but you really can't, you cannot access the other ones, the, other, the top four, because they're like reserved or whatever. So you can only use the bottom four, zero through three. So why would you even bother using a hardware breakpoint over a software breakpoint? The hardware breakpoint will not modify the program. Since an int three in the software breakpoint, since a, since a software breakpoint inserts something into the program, an actual instruction, that means the checksum of the actual program has changed. So if, imagine if you had a separate thread watching and saying, oh, the program was changed. All of a sudden, I can't run. I'm, I'm, being in, I'm in a debugger or something. I'm just going to quit. That's how you get around that. Or you patch the uh, checksum calculator, but this, this is faster. It works. Opcodes. Opcodes are the hexadecimal representation of assembly instructions. It's the, see if you were, it's the stuff you see if you open it up in a hex editor. Yara rules match these opcodes, for the most part. As you can see, we have our assembly opcodes. I think you already went over this. I, did you? All right. All right. As you can see, though, like, for example, a call instruction will start off with E8, maybe. You want to say that louder? No. No. All right. Tracing. Run tracing. Something I don't use, but actually I started using it the other day. It's actually not that bad. If you, the, the concept of the run trace is that you have a certain set of conditions, right? So in this case, if the EIP is in range of this or this, or if, uh, if it's outside of this range, or I don't know, if, if EBX or one of the registers equals this particular value, then stop or alert us. So it, it's really... Uh, conditional, I guess. It's, 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 one, it's more of those, uh, when the hell am I ever going to use this? But w once in a while, you might actually find a use for it. I just thought I'd bring it up. Padding and all that. I have the power. Someone say question? No, okay. So, I have the power. This is what, this is what I was thinking of. I, I was thinking of, uh, what's, what's his face? Uh, Conan, the, the barbarian here, and uh, Skeletor. He man, I'm sorry, jitters, I'm sorry. All right, so with the debugger, you have total control over your program, and you should see, and you should never forget that. If you see a function that looks juicy in Ida or something like that, and you you have no possible, and you can't see a plausible way of getting to it, you can always just double click, modify the program's instruction, and jump to it and step through it. So whenever I, that's one of the things a lot of people don't get when they when they're reverse engineering malware is the, here they'll, here they'll have their actual function they'll have their program and they want to jump to the actual the good parts like the loader or the the part that's responsible for connecting connecting home or whatever if you know where it's at you can jump to it and just step through it no problem. Um, this is a jump to self. So it's uh, one of those old school tricks that assembly, uh, uh, an assembly guru will tell you about. It's where uh, you jump to five, you jump forward two bytes, and the jump itself is two bytes. So you jump forward to yourself. I, I just thought I'd throw that in there. It is a handy trick, though. So for example, say you run into a piece of malware. And for some reason, you create a new thread, um, it creates a new thread or it creates a new process and you can't get it to run. Like, it creates a, it creates a new process and, of itself and you want to be able to connect and you want to be able to uh, jump on it, on that creation. So what you would do is you would modify the entry point of the, same pro of the uh, initial program to jump to self. And what happens is Windows will be like, oh, okay, and it continuously run into itself over and over and over again. That allows you to actually connect a debugger to it. It's really handy. I just thought I'd throw that in there just for fun. Basic debugger usage. All right, we're going to load up a program here in our samples folder called debugger test one. So the concept of this talk, I thought I'd be handing out thumb drives. So 
Yeah. Anyone want a thumb drive here and actually go through this? All right. Step on up. There is malware on this, so be careful. <laughs> there you go. I only got like 10 of these, so you're going to have to copy it and send it to the next person. Maybe. All right, I got one more. I'm not throwing it. I throw like a girl. I throw like a little girl. Sorry. All right. No, wait. I, my bad. I have two left. Anyone else? Uh, I'm not. I'm not throwing it. You have to come up here. One. Two. All righty. I bought those cheap. You can buy them. You can buy them from China. I got ten of them for thirty bucks, and they're eight gigabytes a piece. That's that's a really good deal. And I know you're all thinking like, oh no, they're gonna try and own us. No, that's the thing. I tested each one first. All right, I wouldn't do that to you. Sure, there's malware on it, but it's not. You know, like I'm not gonna try and intentionally try and screw you guys over. That's not like me. All right. So in the folder we have a basic debugger usage. There's a program on there called debuggertest1.exe. Just load it up into the debugger of your choice. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to load it up in my debugger and we're going to go through it. There is a file here. Let me debugger test one. Debugger test one. Should it should look something like this when you open up your thumb drive. Except there's an additional folder called tools. I didn't feel like copying thousands and thousands of tools everywhere, so I just this is just this is what it should look like. There should be a folder right here called debug test one. And inside of that, debug test one.exe. Do you have it? Good. Awesome. OK, so assuming this is malware, it's not. Go ahead and drag and drop it and load it up into your uh, program here. And what you're going to do now is single step it. The process of single step is super duper easy. It means step one at a time. To do that, press the F8 key assuming you're using Immunity. If you're using Ollie, it should be F8. If you're using uh, WinDBG, screw you. <laughs> so in this particular case, we're going to single step until something happens. Step single step. Single step, there's two, t there's, two t there's two kinds of steps. There's step into and step over. If you step into, it means step into a function. Step over means step over a function. If you you can literally keep on stepping into something until you eventually hit until you eventually hit kernel mode code and nothing happens. But single stepping, even even stepping over, is going to take a really, really long time. So to get around that, what you should do is look for strings or look for something good. The way I do that in Immunity is you right click, choose find re or choose search for, and then choose all referenced text strings. Here you will actually here what it'll do is it'll actually search through the entire program and look for any strings. In this case, as you can see, uh, I, I don't know if you can see that too well. Let me zoom in. Give me one second, please. I hate Windows 8.
God, I hate Windows 8. <laughs> All right. Can you see that a little bit better? Yes? Yeah. All right. So in this particular case, it says name of system, percent S, your volume name, your serial number, your special key. What, so most likely, this is probably some sort of key generation algorithm program, right? Logically. So in order to get to that particular area, all you got to do is double click on it. It should automatically take us to this particular address. And here we are. What we can do is we can set our breakpoints. To set a breakpoint, all you have to do is double click. When you double click in this particular area right here, it will set a breakpoint automatically for you. If you double click here, all that happens is it asks, do you wish, do you wish to assemble here? And it's annoying. If you double click here, it changes stuff and it's annoying. So click in here if you want to double click to set a, to set a breakpoint. There are other ways to set breakpoints. I think F2 does it. Um, I think you can do it from the debug thing over here. But I find it a lot faster just to double click. It's, it's easier that way. So by setting the debug breakpoint here, what we're going to do is we can now run the program. By running the program, it should stop right here at this particular address, at this particular instruction where it says name of S. Name of, uh, name of, come on. You're just going to have to take my word for it that says name of, name of something. So when we run it, it should say breakpoint at x address, name of system, percent s. When we click this up and bring it open, nothing's happened yet. But we were able to skip over a lot of stuff. So now when we step over, not in, but over, step, 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 we can watch the contents of the, we can watch the contents of the stack and look for any changes. We can watch the contents of the registers and look for any changes. Nothing. Nothing yet. Check back over here. Name of system NTFS. So something has happened. That's a plus. Let's go back over here. Let's keep on stepping. And for fun, let's step into F7. F7. All right, F7. We should be, all right, we're over here. Let's see, what's it doing? Moving the content, moving the contents of whatever the heck this is into EAX, moving the contents into EDX, Shifting right, moving it, multiplying it, XORing it, returning. Okay. So it's going to return the value from EAX, this whatever the heck this value is right here. Okay, whatever. Step, 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 return. Bring it up. So shows us our special key. Anyway, the, the point of this quick ex exercise, as stupid as it was, was to actually familiar familiarize yourself as much as possible with the debugger, because it will save you so much time to know how a debugger works and how to, how to navigate through it. All that stuff with, uh, with the uh, referencing text strings, setting breakpoints, single stepping, find, determining what's good, what's not good. It's all, so half of it is guesswork, half of it isn't guesswork, but it's, it's still time consuming. But the point is, if you're familiar and comfortable with the debugger, being a reverse engineer for malware is going to be a lot easier. Otherwise, it sucks. So in our folder here, you'll notice a few other file names here. You'll see a, you'll see a folder here named CrackMe's. You'll see another one named Guess the Password. These are really, really super duper basic CrackMe's I wrote that will help that will help you get familiarized with the debugger. 
I mean, assuming you aren't already familiar with a debugger, I, I don't know. This is like a class for basic, basic newbies. But if you're familiar with a debugger, this will really, um, this, everything you do in, the, in, the, in, in, in reference to malware analysis will go a lot smoother. Now, there's two kinds of malware analysis, or malware analysis, plural. Um, there's one, the one kind of malware analysis is, it's high level. It's, you don't really care about how it works. You're, you're in a time crunch. You're getting so much of it. You don't, you don't really care too much. So, what, so in that particular case, just run Cuckoo or something. But if you actually want to get familiarized with how malware works, then get comfortable with, de with the debugger because there's going to be a lot of time with it. All right. Now let's go back to our talk here. Uh, uh. Patching. Patching is super duper important. When it, comes, when it comes to reverse engineering, patching is your friend. The concept of patching means to change a few bytes somewhere and make the program do something completely different. There's a few different ways of patching. You can do it with a hex editor. That's the old, the old, old school method of doing it. There's using the debugger. That's the, my, my favorite way of doing it. And then there's the write process memory API, which is how most trainers do it. If you've ever used a, t if you've ever used a cheat tool or a cheat engine, um, it uses write process memory or some implementation of write process memory. Patching, once again, as you can see in Immunity Debugger, all you really had to do was double click on something and it would come up with a little assemble window. In that assemble window, you can change the uh, instructions to do different things. In this particular case, I have the, the, I have the, the uh, before and the after. In this case, I ha it's calling the sleep function. It's printing something, and it's jumping back and forth. And, f and actually, what it's doing is it's, uh, it's EBE9 means do, um, jump back four spaces. Essentially, it would have been an infinite loop. But by patching over it, by replacing, a p by replacing it with a bunch of knobs, I skip over the sleep call and the jump, and I'm able to continue. In, the in reference to patching in, in malware analysis, um, patch over something like, I don't know, like a sleep call or, a re or a maybe a file creation or a reboot. It's really handy. All right, now for the fun. Basic malware analysis. All right, open up the folder, or open up the uh, program, order ID three, I'm not gonna say that number. It should be in the samples folder, I handed it out. Excuse me. All right, so this is an, this is an actual sample of malware, some of the stuff I would, would encounter all the time at various places I've worked at. In this particular case, this originally came as a PDF. Um, it came pa packaged with a zip file, but the extension was gone. It had originally had it had a PDF icon, but it was actually an EXE. Taking advantage of the old Windows trick. The old Windows trick is, and at a lot and at various huge corporations, they don't want to enforce it. I'm not going to name any names. The uh, if you have an icon, if it looks like a PDF, it's about the same size. And Windows, win, the uh, Windows setting that says uh, show extensions of known file types types is off, then people are just going to click on it, and they're not going to know any better. Now you can take it a step further by actually opening a PDF file, so that way they they think nothing's wrong. Then they're just going to keep going about their lives. So and that that's that's the case of this particular malware here. In, but in this case, I, I removed the uh, icon because uh, I accidentally double-clicked on it at work. That's, that's why I thought it was funny. So I thought I'd bring it in and go over it. So we're going to bring it into our debugger here. Loading. 
Quick statistical analysis reports that this code might be compressed or encrypted. It contains a large amount of compressed or embedded data. Some of the results may be wrong. Do you want to continue with your analysis? No, I'm done. I'm going home. No. Yes. Continue. So, one thing I was going to get into, but I have to wait, is um, packed code. Most malware you run into today will be packed. There are thousands of packers out there. I think that last time I looked, there were over 9,000 packers. I was going to throw up the over 9,000 reference with the Saiyans, but I, I just I couldn't do that. This, this is goofy enough. So, in the case, since most malware is packed, you are going to have to get familiar with the concept of unpacking. But we'll get to that in just a sec. In this particular case, I'm just going to go over the basics of what you do when you encounter the malware. The first, what's up? I have that referenced at the last end of my slides where I tell you where to get all the malware from. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. But I gave you a small taste, but I have a much larger palette. I have something like, uh, I don't know, eight or 900 samples over the course of six months that I actually went through and did and r did write-ups on and all that. It was like super duper obsessive compulsive, but I will give you that just a link to it. I, I didn't want to put it all on the drive. All right, continuing on. What was I saying? Most malware is packed, but there, um, there are ways of getting around the packing. Um, so initially with this run, what we're going to do is we're just going to see what happens when we run it. But we want to set, but we want to set breakpoints at certain at certain places. So. This is our initial run with the malware. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run, I'm going to set some breakpoints. There's two ways. Of, um, there's another way I, way I forgot to bring up with breakpoints. You can set breakpoints on certain system functions without or um, so anytime they're called, the malware um, the pro, the debugger will automatically stop at them. So anytime a so if you've ever used GDB's catch catch all syscall function, what that does on GDB is it, it'll catch every single syscall made. This is pretty much the same thing, except at more granular level, because if you were to do, if you were to try and catch every single syscall going on on Windows, you would never ever complete. So what we would do, so what we do is we're going to set breakpoints at basic functions that we know c cause or are the direct result of malware. So you do that by typing the BP command then the name of the function. So, I don't know, how about file creation? BP create file A. Then let's do W. A for ASCII, W for wide. I can't, if I just do create file, it's gonna, rip, it's gonna give me an error saying, beep, does not exist. It's the unknown identifier. So, now when I run the malware, it's going to say, it's going to continue until it encounters something here. Create file, um, breakpoint at create file. It gives me a little breakdown. In this case, create file reference, file name, c colon slash myapp.exe. In the case of myapp.exe, it seems like I kept getting this particular malware all the time. Like this was the indicator of compromise right here, c colon slash myapp. In the case of a malware analysis, what I typically do in my notes is I make use, I, I, I make up a map of all the main API calls that it might have hit. So in this case, I would copy this down. But there's a create file call that, ha that happened at this particular address. So if we want to see what's going on at that particular address, we right click, we copy to the clipboard, control G, paste it in. Remove the junk. Enter. And it's not showing us much, but it is showing us stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click here. It's going to say, are you sure you want to put your breakpoint here in the middle of nowhere? Yes. And then I'm going to run. And there's another breakpoint. Another breakpoint was hit, this time from the kernel. I don't care. Continue. 
And now there's our breakpoint that we just set. And now I can single step and inspect. Jump around. And I'm just looking for information. When I say information, what I'm doing is I'm actually following and looking for strings in either the, in either the stack area or the memory dump area. And I'm looking for useful information. So when I say useful information, I can be like, uh, let's see. If, I, if, if it's making an access to a file, maybe it wants to read the file, or maybe it wants to write a file. So in that particular case, if I had gone BP and I'd gone read file or write file, the next time it encountered a read file or write file, it would break on it, and I'd be able to inspect the memory around it. So in the case of the write file API call, um, if I had MSDN up right now, if I had the internet up, I haven't been able to get the internet today. It's, it's, it's the gods. But in the case of the write file API, the fourth, the fourth address, or the fourth parameter for write file is, is buffer. The buffer variable tells you, the buffer variable is, the contents of what's going to be of what's going to be written. So, let me give you a better example. Debug, restart. Okay. BP create file. A. Did it hit A or W? Probably W. So, let's bring up. Now I know what you're saying. I know what you're probably thinking is like, do I really have to type in BP in the name of everything? No. There's another utility in my folder right here, or in in the folder that I included under the tools folder that said my BP. That's that's a Python script I wrote, and what it does is it sets breakpoints for all the common of all the common functions that most malware will execute and run at the most basic level eventually. So even if it's something is packed, eventually it's going to have to call um, memory allocate, or it's eventually going to have to call a create process. Eventually, so by setting by running my my BP Perl or Python script, if it, um, you don't have to type BP and do this individually. I, I was just using it as an example. All right, so BP space write file f enter and run it f5 no that's not that's visual studio someone someone got a giggle back giggle out of that f9 run it so we have a breakpoint set for create file f9 create file f9 create file again f9 create file again f9 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 Nine. There we go. Write file. So here we see write file here. I know it's hard to read. I got to bring up the. Uh, I got to bring up the magnifier again. I really hate Windows it's Eight. Mag. Fire. All right. So this is what I was talking about earlier when I said the write file API. You can see the call, the buffer, the number of bytes it reads, the number of bytes to be written. But what we're interested in here is the buffer. If you right click and choose follow and dump, what it will do in turn is show the contents of the dump. Does anyone think this might possibly look a little familiar? MZ, this program might be run in DOS mode. Yep, that's a JPEG. <laughs> so in this particular case, what we can do is we can right click Choose backup, save data to file, and let's throw it on the desktop. Save it as what are you dot exe. Enter. And now, technically, it's unpacked. I, I, I know I'm getting ahead of myself here, but now it's technically unpacked. But most of, the, most of the time, if you encounter packed malware, it's not that simple. But in this particular case, these guys weren't exactly pros, so that, that's, that's how they were doing their packing. But I digress. Bring up properties here. Anything, different, anything good? Let's see. CNET networks. Yeah, seems legit. <laughs> KGB email bug leers. Seems legit. Frog.exe, yeah. Ale Alexa Epic Yards, yep. 
Yeah, that seems pretty legit to me. Now, what we can do is we can actually take a peek at the program now that it's technically decompiled, or uh, now that it's technically quote unquote decrypted, we can now take a peek at it in IDA. And that was, that's something I was gonna show you originally. I was gonna show you uh, what the program looked like in IDA before being unpacked and what the program looked like after it was unpacked. But I, again, I'm, I'm getting too far ahead of myself. I have an entire section on unpacking and I was, was going to get to it, but I couldn't find an unpacked piece of malware. Let's see. God, I hate this magnifier. Downloads. Random malware, samples, tools, crack me, sample. That the, was that it? Sample? Oh, please do please do do please use a newer version of Ida. Come on, yeah, because it's trying it's trying to screw it. Overwrite. Go. All right. So in this particular case, this is what most packed malware will look like in Ida. You'll notice the lack of functions. You'll notice the lack of pretty much everything. If you if you bring up the if you do shift F12, which is the default hotkey for show me the strings, which I use all the time, you'll notice string references to maybe two or three things, but everything else looks like gibberish. That's typically a good sign that it's packed. Other ways of checking to see if a program is packed un include opening up the file with a program called CFF Explorer. Right click, CFF Explorer. Um, again, I, I included this on the uh, tools utility part, on the tools part of the uh, thumb drive. It's called Explorer Suite. That's what it is, CFF Explorer. The ways of checking to see if a program is packed, look at the section headers. This is usually a dead giveaway for most packers, but not all packers. In the case of this particular piece of malware, they're not using, tradi they're not using traditional packing methods such as, section, such as uh, UPX or Armadillo or P or all the other commercial packers out there. It seems they're using a more, a more primitive method. Nonetheless, you can, um, CFF Explorer will, sh will, will show you all the executable information, like such as the, the section headers and all that other good stuff, the imports, exports, all this. It's really useful. And it, as you can see, it's showing me a bunch of nothing. And that's, a, that's, another, that's another thing about malware. In its packed form, you're going to notice little tiny oddities. Like in this case, I'm opening up its resources section, and it has a, it has a bunch of entries for a bunch of nothing. Supposedly, this is language information, but it's just nothing. And another another dead giveaway that it's malware, as despite the fact of where you, um, never mind the fact that you may have gotten it from like some exploit or something. Most of the time, malware will have some stupid name like uh, Firefox.exe, you know, totally legit and not actually have the Firefox icon. Or it'll say Windows Updates or something. But anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself again. I'm sorry. Frog.exe. Frog.exe. Yeah, it seems legit, especially that KGB part. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So now we were going to compare IDA, the IDA results of what you saw in packed form to the what we see in unpacked form, quote unquote. So, right click, copy, bring vbox svr slash downloads. Paste it. Let's go ahead and close it. Downloads. What the hell are you supposed to be? And open. So what? It, it didn't unpack right, or is this just the gods attacking me today? Nonetheless, it seems I've, like I said, I, I've already gone through all this stuff already. So in the in the in the particular case of sample one, I have other programs to look at. I have. Um, IDB files, mem files, all this other stuff, CSRSS.exe, dump one. 
this one, that's probably it. Yeah. Closet. Pack it. Closet. Open it. <sighs> Swear to God, the whole world's against me right now. Overwrite. Open. There we go. That, that, that looks a lot more like what it should be. So just, as, just assume that I dumped it right in this particular case. So this probably looks a lot more, a lot different from what we actually originally looked at, but it's totally legit, right? I mean, CNET, I, I process, next, create tool, snapshot. If we were to bring up these strings, I hate it, it keeps bringing up that window. Click here, shift 12, there. Oh yeah, snTP.gmail.com, mail.yahoo.com. Yeah, that's totally legit. So the reason why we like to unpack our malware to take a peek at it is sometimes, sometimes you'll encounter a piece of malware where there's a whole bunch of different there's a whole bunch of different um, Call, command and control callout servers, or the command and control callout callout server is something very common. In this case, mail.gmail, SNTP, whatever. It would be really hard to discern command and control in a normal means without actually di deep diving into the code in this particular case. But we can actually take a peek and look over here. Yep. Exports. I don't, did, did I go over IDA yet? No, I, I didn't. I, I, I kind of didn't want to go over IDA because IDA is expensive. I mean, it, you're going to dump out uh, like 500 bucks easy for IDA, but it's easily one of the best tools ever. I personally, I, I don't really like their debugger, but I like everything else about it. I like all the plugins people made for it. I like all the, I like all the syntax highlighting. I like everything else but the debugger. Why is the plugin so IDA free you can still do quite a bit? True. It's old, but. True, but in this particular case, we have our command and control IP. We have a string right here, not exactly showing itself off, but at echo off, if, or um, delete this particular file, if exists. So this is a cleanup script that it runs on itself. Create environment block, destroy environment block. Is it, is it am I a 64-bit process? Stuff like that. And call up. So I'm going to now go back to my talk here. F5. Get ahead of myself. Software hardware, tracing at the power, tracing, tracing, patching, patching, power analysis, reporting. All right. There is no, all right, there, sh there is no real typical recording or reporting or recording structure when it comes to classifying and documenting malware. I mean, maybe there's a standard out there that someone wrote on some blog somewhere, but I haven't seen it. So when it, com when it comes to keeping reports, what I like to do is I like to keep it simple. I like to keep it verbose, but I like to include the important pieces of information. So I, w I thought I'd share with you some of my sample reports and what they look like. So in case you're ever working a malware analysis job and you have no idea what you're doing, it's your first day, try and write something like this. So. One of, my site, one of my example reports is available on my website under typical underscore report .txt. I swear it's not a virus, I swear. And you can see right here the different fields. Well, there's one for, um, I, I, I know it's kind of hard to read, but it says file name, file name, MD5 hash, notable API entries, um, command and control information, but I keep it in this general format in a general text file so that way it's easily transferable between other other machines. So on my Mac or my Linux box, I can easily open up the text file and read it. But if it were in like a Word doc or something like that, I hate Word so much, so much. So I try and keep it as text as possible. It's also easier to insert. From, it's also a lot easier to insert this into uh, one of my various databases when it's in a, either CSV format or just text format because I can just copy and paste. If you're a real data wizard, just keep it in text file format. All right, unpacking 101. I 
feel like I kind of went over this already, but I thought I'd share it once again. Most malware today, like I said, is packed in some way, shape, or form. This helps it get around I a antivirus signatures and detection. There are over 8,000, that's why I changed it. I, I didn't want to do the over 9,000 thing, but whatever. There are over eight. There are over 8,000 known packers out there, and each one, each of them have their own different byte signature. Now, a lot of, the, most of them though are just different versions. But it doesn't change the fact that 8,000 signatures. Holy crap, that is a lot. And just, and just looking at, looking at the file in IDA, I just can't automatically tell you. Oh yeah, that that's packed by EXE cryptor. I, I know because I, I'm super smart. That's why we have tools to help us. They can range from simple as si simple, comp simple compression, like the case of um, L like an LZMA compression, like uh, UPX, to full-blown encryption and debugger detection, like in the case of the MIDA, or EXE Cryptor, or uh, I don't know. There, there, there's a whole bunch out there. I, I have a giant image with a whole bunch of them I'm going to show you in just a sec. Um, packers are not foolproof. The EXE has to be decompressed or decomprypted at some point in order to run in the operating system. That is the golden rule. This is why I hope they never have trusted computing. Because once we have trusted computing, we're going to have trusted malware. And then it just sucks. Then my job, I quit. All right, on to Packers. Now, this really super duper confusing Venn diagram is all the different kinds of Packers out there. We have UPX here, FSG, LEXE, ASPAC, the MIDA, Safe Disk, Secure ROM, and the and on on the left hand side, these are more like uh, what you what you typically run into if uh, it, if it's something like uh, shareware or something like that. But on the right is more commercial, like uh, what you'll run into in the case of like video games or su super duper expensive software. If you, if you can afford the MIDA, then hey, more power to you. Use it. AS Protect. Um, the bottom ones here are actually, actually more of what you'll run into in the case of malware. But what I'm running into a lot lately is this entire Venn diagram is just becoming one giant circle because all the malware is using all this stuff. Unpacking 2. I thought I already went over this, but I'll say it again. So in the case of unpacking, there are a few different ways of determining if a, if a piece of malware is packed. The basic, easiest thing anyone can do is if they have 7-zip. If you have 7-zip, 7-zip has the uh, inert ability to open up an executable file and tell you what the section headers are. So in the case of a 7-zip executable, right click on it, choose the 7-zip icon, and then choose open with 7-zip. In this case, I'm opening a file named av avttst.exe and I see this, I see this, ugh. I see the sections here labeled UPX0, UPX1, UPX2, which means it's UPX. There are a number of utilities out there that will automatically identify or attempt to identify packed, packed things for you. Like in the case of, there's a program out there which I included on there called Hook Analyzer. It comes with a fairly decent database of about, of about 4,400 unique samples of, mal of uh, packers. But the number one absolute best one that I've encountered so far is called EXE Info. EXE Info, which I have on my website, and I wasn't able to get on the net, so I'm, I'm sorry I don't have it on the, on the thing, but if you can look it up, it's called EXE Info. It is the, hands down, the best packer identifier out there. It covers the, eight, it covers the uh, 8,000 or 9,000 or whatever signatures, and it has a whole bunch of other Cool little utilities, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So, pick on the right here is uh, what a typical screenshot of what Hook Analyzer looks like. I know it's hard to read that, but you can see if you'll just have to trust me. In this particular case, I'm running it against a version uh, of an executable that was packed with UPX. It'll do its own internal analysis on it and tell you certain things like found one trace of NOP instructions, found potential file name found potential UPX header. So, in the particular, in the case of hook analyzer, it will do a static analysis of any file you throw at it. Even, 
even the, even if it, it ha ends in .exe and you know it's an executable, it'll still say, hey, I think this is an executable. Duh. But nonetheless, if you have a dump file and you think something might be wrong with it, you can run it through Hook Analyzer and it'll actually tell you what it might possibly be packed with. In this case, it says, I think personally it's UPX. And it was right. All right. This is my favorite tool right here. It's called EXE's or EXE Info PE. Great utility. It actually has the biggest database. It has a really simple, semi-simple looking interface to it. It has a bunch of uh, extra goodies that the other tools don't have. It has the ability to statically search an executable and look for, or dump file and look for all the host names, all the IP addresses, all the good stuff inside. It has the ability to look for other executables inside the executables. And it's free. It is free. That makes it number one. Now the unpacking demonstration, I already kind of went over that and I'm sorry. We're going to have to skip over this because I seriously, are, I, I got ahead of myself and I already went over this. So addicting and fun. I know, right? You want to do it again? Yes? No? No. All right. Dynamic analysis for when you either A, don't care about the inner workings and only want a basic top view down of the malware, or B, it's super duper unpacked and encrypted and there's no actual way around it that you can think of and it's 3 o'clock in the morning and you just like screw it or it's like 4.44 and you leave at five, and you just, uh, this piece of malware comes across your desk, and it's like, whatever. You, in that particular case, we lean towards dynamic analysis. Dynamic analysis is, like I said earlier, the use of process monitoring tools, file monitoring tools, um, network analysis, or network monitoring tools, and of course, Kugu. But if you, if you can get Kugu to work, it, it's great. If, but if you can't, then it sucks. Memory analysis. This is a subset of dynamic analysis, is memory analysis. Since memory, for the, since memory is uh, only accessible while it's live and dynamic, uh, it fits into that. So hook analyzer and Votality are excellent memory analysis tools, but the difference is hook analysis will do it live, but vo Volatility requires a memory dump and has to be done post-execution. Another tool which I included on there is called Process Hacker. It allows you to dump a running process's memory for, and allows for inspection and filtering and searching. This can be done via your debugger as well, but it isn't always feasible. So use, use uh, Process Hacker instead. It's a great tool. So here's another look at Hook Analyzer since it supports the use of live memory analysis against a running process. In this case, I double clicked on some uh, malware on purpose, not what you're supposed to do, but whatever, and I connected to it. And it's kind of hard to read, and I'm sorry. Should, should I get out the uh, magnifier? No. All right. So in this case, you enter the process ID that you wish to connect to or you can just drag it, you can just drag click it over, but in this case, connect to it, and this is what it kind of gives you as a dump out. Like, I found in this particular section of code this to be pretty uh, interesting, or I found this, or I found, I found a program here at this particular location in memory, or I found this kind of looks like shell code. It, it'll run through and look for all that kind of good stuff. Process Hacker, I just mentioned this a second ago. Process Hacker is the best tool, in my opinion, for just, if you, if you want to get a quick peek at what my, what me, what's in the memory presently in a user mode process, Process Hacker does a really good job of it. In this case, you double click on the, you double click on the executable in Process Explorer. It'll bring up this window right here on the left you can then choose strings. We'll get the strings of all the running memory, and then you can then filter and search for it. In this particular case, I'm doing a search for anything named exe. So in this case, SVC host, some weird file named on exe. Yeah. Votality in action. So video of me using Votality, volatility, or I'll do it live. I'm just going to do it live. And 
you know what? I've been, I've been skipping ahead through a lot of stuff. And I haven't been asking for if people have questions. So does anyone have any questions so far? There is an excellent utility called ImpRec that will aid in the aid in putting together putting back together the import address table because a lot of times what you'll encounter when when unpacking a piece of malware, you can't run it again because the IAT, the import address table, will be gone, it'll be destroyed. But the point, the reason why we li I like to uh, unpack something is I don't want to run it again. I just want to peek at it in IDA. Imprec, I-M-P-R-E-C. User. Well, I was just going to add on to that. Volatility actually has, if you have like a memory dump, yeah. it has a, a plugin called Imscan. And so basically, if you can, you can dump the file using volatility, and then you can have Imscan dump the, uh, in, uh, the IAT, I think. The IAT. And then you can, uh, you can import that into IDA. So, that's the only place you can get it. You can pull it out with that. There is an excellent, um, there are actually a few excellent um, immunity debugger plugins and Ollie plugins that for the most part I've been having a really, really good success with. I don't have to dump the, it'll actually dump the IAT right for me. So there, um, the utility, the uh, immunity plugin is called Ollie Dump EX. And there's a utility out there that'll convert all the plugins to immunity because you only have to change a few things. But that's what I use. And for the most part, when I'm able to dump an executable, it will dump the IAT right and for me perfectly. So I haven't really had to, had to use Imprec in so long, I just don't even really see the need to bring it up anymore. Other questions? No one? No one? All right. Continuing. So, once again, this is volati volatility. Volatility? Volatility. Tomato, tomato. This is volatility. And you can see the, all the, uh, there are so many stupid options for this thing, but it is an amazing tool for memory analysis and malware analysis because it can actually dump a lot of, a lot of good information. Like, for example, here you can see connections, like any active connections that were going on. Consoles, for example, it'll, uh, anytime there's any command history, it'll, it'll attempt to dump that. Um, any drivers that were loaded. But it, driver doesn't always work, but it, it tries. Um, any executables that were running, it'll, it'll attempt to dump them for you. Um, any files accessed. This is a really great utility. And... Yara scan, a few of these others. Once again, I'm going to have to apologize. I have a utility on, on my website that I was hoping to get, but I was never able to actually connect to the internet. So I, I'm going to have to skip this part. But Votality is great, uh, hands down. Good job, guys. Uh, what are we going to get to next? Double click. F5 again really getting sick of this. I know, right? Microsoft. Crap. Chrome sucks, too. Oh, did I say that out loud? Packing dynamic. All right. This is what someone was asking me before. Where do I get malware? This is really good stuff. You can email me, and I will give you all the malware you could ever possibly handle. 
Um, you can get it from, uh, you can officially get it from offensive, offensivecomputing.net. They actually work with, uh, you, they actually work with uh, Georgia Tech, universe, uh, technical, U Georgia's university's computer department. And uh, what they'll do is they'll archive the malware. If you go to offensivecomputing.net, you can actually search for partial names of the malware. And it goes all the way back to the 80s like old school viruses. Um, if you want, I don't know, zero access or something like that. It has archive copies of variants and everything. It's, it's good stuff. Next is IRC. Um, on, when it comes to IRC and getting your malware, in this particular case, a lot of, um, it depends on the channel you're in. Um, on Freeno, there are a few, there are a few good uh, malware reverse engineering server uh, channels like RE, um, Open RCE, News. Um, you now you're probably wondering why News, but a lot of times, if if uh, if you're on IRC and people think you're a newbie, they'll try and send you malware. So it's it's a good way to get free malware. Easy. <laughs> Reddit, any anytime or 4chan or Tumblr, anytime someone links to an executable on these sites, it's probably malware. Twitter. There are various people to follow on Twitter, but my favorite one to follow is Malware Must Die. They, these are a very sophisticated group of individuals that work to bring down malware. And if you ask them nicely, they will give you the malware they're working on. AV companies. Now, believe it or not, antivirus companies have a lot of malware. And they will give it to you if you ask them nice. If you email an antivirus company and claim you're, I don't know, like a student or something like that, they'll give you access to all the malware you could possibly ever look at. Or you can just ask me. That actually brings me to SyrianMalware.net. Well, there's an individual. There's an individual. I was hoping you'd be here, but he didn't come. He didn't come to TorCon this year. Z right Zach. Will I guess he'll I guess Zach will be here later, probably tomorrow or the day after. But he owns he runs a site called SyrianMalware.net. At SyrianMalware.net, you can get all the you can get all the Syrian crazy looking code malware you can possibly fathom and stomach, and it's all free. You can also get malware from torrents and crack software and the old Nutella networks. Um, you remember Kazaa? People still run Kazaa. LimeWire, people still run that stuff, and there's still plenty of old malware on that, too. Just look for uh, Photoshop or something like that. Photoshop under a Meg. Yeah. It's totally legit. Oh, and spam email. People get so much spam, and a lot of it does actually contain malware or references to sites that contain the malware. But when, whenever anyone says, I don't know where to get my malware from, I think, dude, malware is just pushed in your face all the time. And recently on my blog, I did a blog post on um, malware hosted on SourceForge. And um, I got a bunch of crap for it. I, but it's, it's true. A lot, there, are, there is a lot of malware hosted on SourceForge. Um, and shame on them. Screw you, SourceForge. You guys used to be cool. All right. Help, I'm stuck. If you ever run into a sample... If you ever get stuck on a sample, don't worry. There are communities out there that deal with this kind of stuff. And they are willing to help you, provided you're not a total super-duper noob. And if you've gone through my slides, you're no longer a super-duper noob. You're a few steps higher. Now, now you can go to these sites, and they'll be, able to will it, they'll be willing to help you out. So you can, go on, you can go on Reddit, but Reddit kind of sucks on their slash, on their uh, R malware. Avoid R malware because R malware sucks. Go to R reverse engineering. That one's that one's number one. EXE forums, another great site. They've been around forever. Um, Woodman.net, another great site. Um, I think I misspelled that. Is it W O D M A N N? Anyway, I, I link to it at the end. I'll get to it. I'll keep going. Kernelmo.info, another great, another great forum site. If you have any questions about any piece of malware you've run into and you're absolutely stuck, you can ask on these sites, and they will. A lot of these guys have been doing this forever, and they'll say, "Oh, yeah, I know exactly what that is." Um, but before you do, the first thing I would do is get an MD5 of the actual malware you're working on, Google it, and make sure to see you're not reinventing the wheel. 
a lot of times, a lot of people do is, I'm help, I'm working on this, and I have no idea what to do. And then you look at, and what, what, what they're going to do on kernel mode or whatever is they're going to call you a noob instantly because they just took an MD5 of the file and looked at it and said, and Googled it and said, what, you don't know how to Google? Get the hell out of here. So Google first. Mailing lists. There are a number of excellent mailing lists out there still. Anyone remember the old Daily Dave archives or possibly the old bug track stuff? People still use that stuff. There are a number. Um, you can hop on uh, Google Groups, kind of merged, uh, merged itself with all the old mailing lists, like alt, all the uh, alt dot, alt dot computers dot such and such. You can still search those old archives, but you can also still post to them. There's a number of Google Groups out there here like uh, alt.binary, no, I think it's alt.security. You know, I, I'm getting ahead of myself. I, 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 link, I link more stuff, so. And uh, yes, IRC still works. Additional resources. This, on this guy, this Korkami guy, amazing. Probably one of the best reverse engineer people I've ever met. I, st I stole his, uh, his, uh, his picture of all the Packers with, with the Venn diagrams. This guy made them. He, Hands down, this guy's the reverse engineer guy you want to follow. Um, Woodman.net. Yeah, see, I, I misspelled Woodman. But this site right here contains all the tools you'll ever possibly ever use, and they're all free. Reddit, reverse engineering, great site. And some shameless self-promotion. I, I, no, I got plenty of good guides. Questions? How, how, how much time do I have left? How much? Five minutes. I have five minutes left. Questions? Uh, yeah, well, what do you do for like uh, anonymity or um, like protecting yourself in terms of uh, like do you use Tor or a VPN or uh, something like that when you're trafficking your malware? Um, also, you know, or if it's on like a client site, are you running it uh, with the network? You know, like oh. how are you protecting? I don't understand the question. When, when you say protecting myself, when I'm running it? When I run it, I'm typically not connected to the internet at all. Okay, so, so, but sometimes, you know, to get a different file downloaded from uh, the malware, say it's just, you know, a dropper. Yeah. And to get it, you're going to want to run it. In that particular case, um, I don't really protect myself. I just pull it. I don't care. And they have before. I've run into cases where what what I'll encounter is a, uh, um, like I'll, I'll pull a dropper that drops uh, a bot for a denial of service client, and just to screw around, I'll purposely connect to that uh, to that botnet. And sometimes I'll get lucky, and I'll be on like I don't know, like a IRC server or something like that, and I'll join and just wait. And then I'll quit. I'll slash who and query people and get all give everyone's information. And sometimes I'll get bored and I'll start talking. They'll be like, "How did you find us? <laughs> who are you?" And then they'll kick ban me, and then I'll join again from another IP. I'm like, "Hey guys, what's up?" <laughs> so for the most part, and for the most part, um, they'll either a DDoS you off the internet, and you'll have to come back on another IP, or b they will they'll pay no mind. So when it comes to anonymity, anonymity, blah, and pulling malware, I don't care. I'm shameless. Next. Questions? No? Great. Seriously, though, I, I, I didn't think I'd actually fill the entire time slot. I thought I was talking a little bit too fast. But hey, it worked out. All right, thank you, everyone. Have a great, have a great rest of the day. And uh, yes, please email me. Yeah, shameless self-promotion. What? I don't like changing my phone number. Every time I change my phone number, I lose a bunch of people and people stop calling. It's, it's, it sucks. But with the Austin number, people, don't, people think, oh, you're not from Phoenix? All right, I want to talk to you.